Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good? Been to the party yesterday? Everyone survived? Great. So, I guess, uh, yeah, we're about to start. So, welcome to this, uh, well, last day of NDC conference and the session uh, titled Five to, uh, 50 Ways to Show Your Data. Um, I hope it was clear from the abstract that there won't be like 50 parts to show here, it's more like 15. And uh, also I don't have a continuing story to tell, it's more of a collection of, of goodies I came across. So that's me, my name is Thomas, there's an umlaut in my last name, so you can tell I'm from Germany probably. Uh, I have a degree in business, uh, what do you call it, business economics, whatever it's called in English. Um, but I have been a professional, I'm a developer of, for almost my professional life. Um, I mainly deal with the software that is called Microsoft Business Central at the moment. It used to be Novision, Financials, NAV, Dynamics, whatever the name will be next year. Uh, also, I know a thing or two about SQL Server and obviously the R language and the Power Platform. At the moment, I work for a company called Swicon. We've got the logo there. We deal with uh, Volvo construction machines. And so we have our own IT department, and we are five developers for the Business Central system. Um, today, I'm a bit outside of my usual comfort zone. I usually speak at uh, data platform events, so um, I guess most of you are .NET web developers, but no? Oh, I thought so. In the keynote, everyone said, yeah, web development. Well, OK, we'll get along. <laughs> was, was it the case? Uh, I got some social media data here, some events where I spoke, and well, whatever. Let's get right into it. Um, I'm going to just kick this off here. This is probably the presentation uh, that I gave. Yeah, I like to give that one. I did it a couple of times. Uh, the last time was probably a year ago, so there's some, some new stuff in here, some first times. Um, I'm going to briefly introduction uh, about the R language. Any one of you already know the R language? Uh, one, two, three, sort of, maybe. Okay, don't worry. Um, this is not heavy programming. Uh, it's just a couple of um, of source code lines. Um, a short, yeah. When you do R, you have to know about the philosophy of the tidyverse, the tidy data. Briefly introducing that one, and then the main thing, the the grammar of graphics, which is in the package ggplot. That's what I'll be using for all my demos here, or most of my demos, put it that way. And yeah, we'll go from facets via waterfalls and radar and whatever comes up. Of course, I have, uh, sorry, a roundup and resources. You don't have to, uh, to write anything down or take photographs. I have a link on the last slide where you can get the slides as well as the demo code. Okay? Right, so the R language. What is it all about? It's already also 30 years old. I was wondering, yeah. Uh, it came to be because the two gentlemen, Rob and uh, uh, Ross, were not really, yeah, they, they didn't like how the S language worked because that was proprietary, it was, it was clumsy, you had to pay for it, and it was not very extensible and so on, so they, they made their own language for the purpose of statistical uh, analysis and visualization and so on. It's a new project. You can download the base R system free and also some IDE. Um, it is available for, for all the, the big uh, uh, OSs, uh, Windows, Linux, Mac OS. And it's well, one of the, the core, yeah, I would, I would say, that, that helps make the language or keep the language um, popular is the community. Because when there is a function missing in R, you can develop it, you can uh, compile it into a package and give that to the community so that everyone else can, can benefit from it. And at the moment, there's a so-called CRAN mirror, that's the, the central repository for that. Uh, at the moment, there are more than 19,000 packages available for download. So probably, if, if you run into a problem where you don't have a, a function for or how to use it, how, how to solve it, uh, you go to the CRAN mirror, probably someone has a package for that. Yeah, think of it like an extension library. You can download and install into your system. Um, there's been commercial support for quite a while. There had been the most popular or the most well-known was probably Revolution Analytics. 
Uh, they have been bought by Microsoft a while ago. Uh, yeah, always Microsoft when they uh, actually realize that they're missing some, uh, some knowledge there and then they can't build it quick enough, what do they do? They buy someone. They have the money. Um, there's several IDEs you can use from the, from, I call it Naked R app, one of the base R system. Um, Microsoft had some which have been deprecated already. So I'm going to use the RStudio <coughs> IDE, which also is the de facto standard when you use R. And yeah, you can tell I'm, I'm usually <laughs> a Microsoft shop. Uh, there's R support in SQL Server and, and in Power BI and so on. We're not going to see much of that here. Okay. Then the philosophy of tidy data. Just one slide um, covering that. And probably a name you should have heard is Hadley Wickham. He's one of the brightest minds in the R ecosystem. Uh, and also he, he's, um, uh, where does he work? He's with our studio now. He's been a professor. He's developed several of the packages uh, that belong to the tidyverse and is uh, writing books about it. And then you should have heard the name. And this is how a data analysis, analysis or data science project may look like. You usually import some data you get from somewhere, either from externally or from your own system or from the web or wherever. Uh, usually it's not in a proper format when you get it, so you have to do some, some tidy work, transform it, um, and then you take the circle here of visualizing, maybe um, generating a model if you want to do predictions. And, and then see how it works and, and do the circle of transforming it again to, to visualize and then communicate. We, we will be somewhere between visualize and communicate here today, okay? And all those goes with, uh, with the bracket of programming in order to understand your data better. Uh, and if you use the, the components, so there are some core packages that, use, uh, that belong to the tidyverse, uh, this will be very simple to, to comply with because there's a certain format of the data where you can move it between the packages and they don't have to transform it in between to make the next function work on it. Okay? Right. So, the most important one here of the packages will be ggplot, uh, which is the part here, as the name says, it does plots, it is for the visualization of, of your data. And it was inspired by the grammar of graphics by Leland Wilkinson. And that serves as a foundation for, for the implementation of the whole thing. And you can also, you can read books about it, what's behind it. There's, uh, I have one for the visualization also in my, in my source list. Uh, I have a simple approach to, to what you're going to need to describe a graph using the ggplot package. So we always need the data. What do you want to show? So your, your data source, and then you have a, a thing called a data frame, or maybe a tibble. That's the first like parameter that goes into it. Next is the so-called aesthetics. Basically, that was down to well, what do you want on the x-axis, what do you want on the y-axis? Let's put it like that. Then you have always to specify a geometry. So what do you want your, your visualization to look like? Do you want a, a scatter plot or a bar plot or a line graph or whatever? <clears throat> there are endless possibilities. And then you've got extras you can play around with. Of course, you can, you can twirl with the axes and the labels and then change the colors and the themes and all of that. That goes on top of it. And there's a lot you can, you can add to that. OK. So the next few slides will be, will be naming um, the type of graphic I'm going to show you and have one sentence what it's good for. Uh, I'm not going to rush down the, uh, the slides. Instead, we'll switch over to this one. Can you see that? Is that OK or <laughs> yes. like that? Yeah, you, you don't have to read all the text, of course, just um, briefly. Um, top left, we got a source code window. Of course, you can have several source files open. Uh, on the bottom left, we got the console, where any results will appear. And you can also interactively enter uh, enter function calls or uh, commands. Top right will be the environments. Um, we will see in a minute all the variables that we generate will be listed there and you can inspect them also. 
We got a history function of the of the function calls. We got um, database connections. You can already see up there. I usually deal with Microsoft SQL Server. And you got a tutorial window. So if you install the base system, you can go to the tutorial window. It tells you what miss, what's missing and how to install that. And you can go through the tutorials from within the IDE. OK? So and at the bottom right, not uh, also uh, quite important at least, we got a small like file explorer, if you will. There's a window where the plots will be output. That's the list of the packages that are already installed on my machine. Uh, you've got always you've got the version. You can update them from here. You can you can uh, attach them so to to activate them. We'll see that in a minute. There's a help window because every package is supposed to come with the help uh, page that explains what's inside it, how the function works, and so on. The viewer is for, well, I don't know how to put it, plots that don't go into plot window. Uh, <laughs> we'll see some, some interactive stuff that will be happening in this window. I don't know why they split it. And there you got a presentation window. You can generate markdown presentations from within this IDE also. Those will go in, uh, in this output window. OK. So I've got loaded uh, my demo file up here. And what we can do, we can invoke it line by line by command enter, or on Windows you will be using control enter, I guess. And I'll just do that. And you see on the bottom left, there's the responses from the system. Now, I attached the, the whole tidyverse, which is a, a collection of packages. You see that there uh, on the top, there's one of the little like eight packages that are mostly used uh, when, you, when you do the, the tidy data thing. And also, on the bottom, there's some well, conflicts. Uh, think of overloading a function, yeah? which is um, the, the packages that are just attached bring a function that was already there with that name in the base, so it's, it's overloaded. And we're going to start right into, oh, I need another package first. And I have. Let's see if that works inside this network here. Does it? Or doesn't it? Come on. Right. Yeah, go. I have one data set I like to use, and I've been using that for a while, which is. Uh, Formula One results, Formula One racing series, uh, and this site provides them. And it's the, the Formula One results from 2016. So why 2016? Yeah, to be honest, it was the last time a German was on top. Bear with me. And you see that there's that sort of table here in the middle. Uh, yeah, it goes on down there. And there's, there's lots of distorting things around it, like buttons and, and menus and lots of advertising. So we'll see how we took it together. We'll get to that. What we can do here now is just read the HTML, uh, and then there'll be a note that will be defined as a table. You probably know better than I how that looks uh, under the hood. And I can extract the data from that table. I will do that. And then I have my data. Oh, let me just uh, let me just do that again. I have my data loaded into my system, yeah? So you see uh, at the left there's somewhere other names, at the top we don't have any, any column headers there, but that's the results of the races from zero to, I don't know what's the top, 25 points. You also see the fourth line, that was the, the big white part in between, that's a bit of distortion here, so we have to, uh, to clean up the whole thing. At first I give it some column names. Uh, I'm making it to a table. I've filtered it down to the nine best drivers because otherwise it would be too much. Uh, so uh, make it look like this. Okay? We got the names. Now we got column, uh, column headers for race one to race, I don't know, 21 or something like that. 
all the points the drivers gained in the races and there's zeros where they had zero points before they were like the, the hyphens or what you call them. That would be not very pretty. So that's almost good. For using the tidyverse packages, they prefer the so-called long format. In this one, you've got the races spread out to the red in all the columns. Now, when you convert them to the long format, and I add some more data to it, it looks like this. I got, no, where's the top? I got all my races in one column now, okay? And all the points also in their own separate column. That's the format that the tidy um, philosophy uh, means when, when they talk about tidy data. Have it in that format and all the packages will, will understand that and smoothly you can, you can pass the data on to the next packages. I added some columns and we'll see our first graph in a second. So. I called ggplot and told it to take the Formula One long data and it gave me this. That's a totally the gray area, that's a totally valid graph. It's a call to ggplot, and ggplot says, yeah, I can do something for you. So, what's missing? Of course, we only have the data. I said we need some aesthetics also. We'll do this, and I stated here, my x-axis should be the races, and my y-axis should be the points. So, the system already found out what is there to be. The races are on the x-axis and the range of the points is on the y-axis. But still, we have no geometry. So that follows now. We can do like a point or a line graph. So most probably that's not what you want to see or, or did expect here, of course. But the system doesn't know better at this time. We have to do grouping. We want to group by the driver and then we can make it look like this. So that's probably what you think of when you want to see a, a, a graphic representation, how the points of the Formula One drivers um, develop during the season. Okay, so that's, that's the, the overall points they gained. Um, we can do, yeah, I put in some more data having the average. And there you go, of course, that one is a bit messy. You got the whole picture of, of how many points in which race, and that's only nine best drivers, so that's already crowded. Um, if you want to, and that's the first um, gimmick I want to show you, if you want to make a better overview out of this, you probably can do something like this. Faceting. So, yeah, each diver he gets his, um, his own small subgraph um, with the points and you still you have the, you know, the white lines, the auxiliary lines, so you can a bit compare between the drivers, look what's, what's going on there, uh, how do they compare in a race. For example, this one here, <laughs> race five, both Mercedes zero points, they crashed into each other. Who does not remember Toto Wolf biting into the table? <gasps> Zero points for the team. Yeah. Okay, and, and Dutch people around? No. Well, what, what do you make of this? Usually, at, at that point, when I explain this, the Dutch go like, ah, Max Verstappen, he won that race. <laughs> okay, just kidding. <coughs> okay. Um... So when I clear the graphs in between, it's because sometimes I have, I have uh, problems with the memory just to avoid that. So what else can we do? Uh, box plot. Who knows what a box plot is? Oh, a couple of you, okay. A box plot. This one. So that goes more into the... Well, statistics of the races, because the box plot says something about the, the distribution of, of your data, the distribution of point counts. Um, let me see. We start with the third one here, I guess. That's Mr. Ricardo. If, if you look at this, uh, this box here, 
Um, we have this fat line in the middle that says in, that's a 50% line. In 50% of the cases, he gained less than, whatever it is, 12 points. And in 50% of the cases, he gained more than 12 points. I cannot, for the life of me, remember if 12 points is, it falls into the, the lower or the upper case. I have to look it up. Um, the boundings of the box are 25% is the lower bound and 75% is the upper bound. So in 25%, he was like 10 points or lower. And there, that leaves, of course, 25% on the top. So in 25%, he would have like 15 points. Then you have the whiskers. that They have a defined length, never mind. Um, maximum is, I think, one and a half box heights or something like that, whatever. And then you got points that lie outside the range of those whiskers, like that one above or, or one at the, top, uh, at the bottom, sorry. Those are called outliers, and, and they are always marked uh, as, as single points. Now, if we look at those two on the left, those are Rosberg and Hamilton. They look exactly the same in this uh, graphic representation, and yet Mr. Rosberg won. So why can't we see that here? Who knows? Well, let me just switch over and show you some of the data that is represented here. If you look at the statistical data there, the, the minimum is the same for both. The first quarter, that's the, the, the lower box end, is the same. The median is the same, that's the line in the middle, and some of the other ones. The only thing that's different here is the mean value. The mean value differs. Where Rosberg has a bit higher mean value than Mr. Hamilton, but that is not part of the box plot. So you don't see it here. Yeah? Uh, because of the mean is higher, of course, in the end, the, the, the end result is higher. Uh, but that's not represented in a box plot. So, yeah. I wouldn't call it already lying with statistics, but it's a bit of a tendency. What you want to show, how you want to show it. You want to, well, influence your audience or, or show them the way you want to see it. You would like to have it, okay? So you can do things like that. Uh, one other graphic representation. If you look at the far right one, you can tell why that is called a violent plot. It's also um, about the, the distribution. Uh, it, it's probably hard to see, but like here for the first two ones, you may be able to see that for um, Rosberg, it's a bit smaller, the graph at the bottom, and for Lewis Hamilton, it's a bit wider. That means Rosberg had less of the zero points, and Rosberg had more of them, which in the end, of course, leads to him being uh, a bit below. And yeah, if you want to, to measure it like at the, let me see, where is it? Somewhere here, 1820 points, you can tell that Rosberg's graph is a bit wider, so he gained a bit more points at the, at the higher level. So all in all, in a sum, he won the season because he made a couple more points then. Okay? Okay. So next up, yeah, that was one. Someone came up to me and asked, how oh, do you do it, lollipops? Um, R has some, some built-in data sets, which are not very current. So one is the... What do I do here? Uh, empty cars. It's about car data, like like uh, engine, horsepower, and stuff like that. And because that is integrated, you can use it as an example. So it will always be the same, no matter where you install your R system. It's within uh, it's within the base installation, the data, uh, and you can always replay it on another R system. Okay. So in, if you want to like show the mileage of the model, you can do like this, but this is totally boring. It doesn't get much better if you do it in color. So maybe what you can do is like this, lollipop. But that is the simple version. Uh, and, and this one went to show that you can do it by hand, so to speak. You can combine a point and a segment um, geometry 
to form the lollipop. But of course, there's also a, a dedicated lollipop geometry. And you can change a bit the parameters so you can make it uh, go sideways. Uh, you can even um, add the third dimension. So um, the colors show that the, the four cylinder models in blue, six cylinders in black, and you see the gasoline gases, eight cylinders in red, all compared to each other. You have to like it to use it. So we stay with the card data just a bit longer. Oh, yeah. There we got like mileage over displacement, cars of the 2000s. Um, there are a couple of five cylinder models and they are not very good to see, I guess. Okay, you can change the color, but what you can do also to, to help find them is encircling it. So you encircle the, uh, the distinct cylinder model ranges. Um, the, the shape of the circles uh, is determined by the system. So that, especially this one is a bit, no, it's not a circle, right? And yeah, let me see one more thing you can do. Oh, yeah. And certainly the, that, that went, okay, now um, let me show you. There's, there's two um, car data sets in here. One is of the 70s and one is of the 2000s. And what I found remarkable here, if you look at the 2000s, the, the top value of the MPG is around 35. And if you look at the cars of 1974, it was already there. So where's the progress? I mean, and also, of course, the, the big gas in castles there, they're like, what is it, 10 or 15 miles per gallon. Also, that hasn't changed all too much. Maybe it's time for all electrical cars. I don't know. Okay. okay. Mm. Yes. So let me just zoom in here. If I ask you how many data points are in this in this uh, visualization, what will be your answer? Rough number. One. Hundred? Hmm? Fifty. 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 Cool. Actually, there are two hundred and something. Two hundred and thirty-four. <laughs> well, you don't see them all because uh, let me just see which one was it. MPG. Because what they did here was to have the mileage and integer numbers. So you have like. 18 miles per gallon, 18, 18, 18. In reality, it's probably like 17.9 and 18.1, <clears throat> but they all rounded it to integer numbers, so they are overplotting. There is, uh, well, let me show you. And to overcome that, we can do different things like adding some, some jittering. And if you look at the bottom left there, in this one, it looked like one single data point, and in reality, there's five of them. And while the top right ones, they are single points. And you see also in the middle, that there's more of them uh, to see. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a trade-off between the precision and, and the, overall, uh, the, the overall impression you get. Of course, the five are not at their proper position at that moment, but you see that there's more than just one point in the in the other um, representation. Or alternatively, you can uh, you can play around with the diameter of the points. Yeah, so the single ones they were small, and at the top, uh, at the bottom left, sorry, it grows in diameter, so you have the impression there's more than just one point to it. Okay. Uh, so, what have we? Oh, yeah, okay. Now, if you want to label your points, the, the standard function does it like this. It always prints the label right across the data point you got. So, 
that's no good. And we can overcome that by adding something that's called a repel, is that right? So you see, it tries to move the labels uh, a bit away from the points, either on top of them or to the bottom. And there, for the Dodge Challenger, when there's not enough space to, to move it close to its point, there's a little line pointing where the label actually belongs to. Another alternative which can, again, add a, another dimension is using a background color here, and again we got four, six, and eight cylinder models uh, distinguished by the color. Right. So I'm, I'm not meaning to get political, but did you have general elections lately? No. You just swap your prime ministers, do you? Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I took the, the data from the German federal parliament here to, to do a representation. Probably you see that every election night in the telly. And it's as simple as this. So that's the representation of the German parliament. Um, you can have different colors. You, you give it the colors and you can either have all the seats, so one, one little point equals one seat in our parliament. Or I guess on the telly they do it like that more often. So you see the, the parts, and, and with that you probably see better which coalitions are possible and which not. Can That's, you change the AFD to black? Pardon? Can you change the AFD to black, which is their regular color? Yeah, well... <laughs> the traditional color for, for the for the Chris Democrats is this black in that okay. case. So they are on the far right end, so I know. yeah. But um, I'm not sure if that is the recommended color, but black was there for them first, so I, I didn't switch that. Uh, I have a question. Yes. The heat function at the, at the little dots. Yes. This one. Uh, this one is as this automatically built in kind of a standard into the RC2s. Oh, you get it into the RC2s? Yeah, no, no you, you have to use a, a package. So, uh, let me see what it was called. It was called uh, GGPOL for political something, oh, okay. blah. So, uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, um, uh, my bad. Every time I, I call a library something, I add another package to, to, the, to, the, to the current project to use the function. And the ggpol package brings the function, where is it? Either this one, the geom parliament here, and the geom akbar, which was the second one. But that, then they, they bring it in that shape automatically and you can just say what the colors are and then how big the, 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 uh, how big the parts are. Uh, and I guess you can also yeah, you could, you could play with the diameter of the arc, of course, yeah. Okay? All right, so next I have something that's called the tree map. If you are like me, you will probably expect something else that we see here. Um, I pulled data from the World Bank, but that's data for the um, mobile phone subscriptions. And I pulled some country data and I guess that's the crowded one, yeah, I break it down to Europe. And that is what actually is called a tree map. So every, every um, value is represented by the size of the area. So you see that we have Europe and it's, it's uh, divided in, in the parts, Western, either, and so on. And for example, when you see bottom left, the Russian Federation, it's not the most current data, but still, um, the Russian Federation has half of all the um, cell phone subscriptions in Eastern Europe, for example. So the, the biggest one. Up there we got like Germany, which is, well, maybe a third of Western Europe. And, and what I found most remarkable is that the United Kingdom is in Northern Europe. 
Who would have thought? Also Ireland. But that may be influenced, I'm not sure. If you have the, the um, Microsoft um, Azure data centers, they have regions, and uh, when you order um, capacity in the northern one, it's in Ireland. And the western one is in Amsterdam, I guess. So I got some, some Danish colleagues who ordered capacity in the northern data center, and they're further away from the data than if they had booked it in the, in the, in the Western data center, actually. Good one. So, okay, now I've got one example how really good the community works because waterfall, oh, don't do that to me. Um, I was looking for a package that would give me waterfall uh, visualization, and I found two of them. And for the first, for my first try, I had this result. You see that the rather large white area at the at the bottom, which is below the zero line, I couldn't get rid of it because that's not part of my data. It's it's just there. I couldn't get the the zero line to come down. So um, I found the, the author of this package and I wrote to him and said, hey, you look at this, this is my sample data, that's what your package gives me. I think it may be off a bit. And what happened, it was about three weeks later, not more, that there was a new version of his package on the Grand Mirror for download and that worked properly. And so we have the waterfalls library package with an S at the end and for an alternative, I, I looked in the meantime, I found the waterfall without the S. Uh, yeah, different package, different graphics. So there's not much to a waterfall diagram. You've got some, some data like when you start an in, uh, inventory count and then you, you follow how the inventory goes up and down by scrapping or purchasing or selling. And that is the result of the package where I just showed you the other uh, uh, graphics. There's a small white line which is totally okay there, but the big area is gone. So, and what the waterfall does is it, it starts at a value like this. You have a, a stock of 100. And, and the next one always starts at the baseline of the previous one. So here we, I don't know, we, we scrap 20, so it goes down, and the baseline for the next is this one. We purchase 150 items, it goes up, up and down, up and down. Uh, and the last one, the total at the end, is uh, even calculated automatically. Okay? So I'm doing on time. Okay. And yeah, to show you the, the other package, it would do it like this. It's a matter of taste. Okay, also for correlation plots, I found three different um, packages. I'm gonna load them all. Do a bit of cleaning in my data, right. And we again have car data, I think it's a 74 version. Well, never mind. Um, it is all numeric, um, numeric uh, measures there in there. Uh, what you can do for numeric measures, you can calculate a correlation factor, or correlation coefficient, whatever you call it. And I did that for all the things there. So we have a correlation matrix. Let me give you an example. Maybe this one. So we have the, the horsepowers on one axis and the, the engine displacement, the displacement, so the, the volume of the engine on the other one. And the correlation factor says it's 0.79, which means because it's positive, when one of the values rises, the other one rises also. And with a 79%, you can, you can um, explain the rise of the one with the other measure. If it was negative, then it would be one goes up, the other goes down. Yeah. And those values are maximum plus one, minimum is minus one. The closer it is to the one, uh, the better is the, the correlation between the two. So if, if it's rather close to zero, there's almost no correlation, it can go like boo 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 boo. 
And then, of course, you can visualize that stuff. Either like this, yeah, that's the standard one from the, the ggplot additional package. That was not so, I thought that was better to see. You see the scale up there between minus one, which is red, plus one, which is blue. Uh, the darker it is, the closer it is to the to the uh, edge values. If it's white, almost here, it's zero. So all the points are the points on the on the diagonal line are dark blue and full circles because MPG and MPG has a correlation of one, of course, it correlates to itself. And the others are well, the, the bigger the circle, the closer it is to the one value. Uh, and also, um, the darker they are, the closer they are to the one value. And you can even do, yeah, you can do like this. And I've got one here. That's a bit overdone. So I threw in everything that's possible here. You actually have the colors. You have the slope. If it's not, if it goes like that, it's positive. If it goes like this, that's negative. Also blue and red. Also. Thick circles, small lines, and, and don't do that if you want to show it to someone and, and to make him understand it. If you want to confuse people, you can take a graph like that. Okay. Right. Uh, let's do a bit of data analysis. So let's pretend we are receiving some data and, and the first um, visualization looks like this, X and Y points or whatever, and you can do a so-called scatter plot. So who of you would, would be able to tell where the, where the hotspots are in terms of X direction or Y direction from this graph? Not so good, yeah? So what you can do is add some marginal plot like this. And you see that in the in the x direction you got the maximum of here, so probably this area, and in the y direction you got two maximum. I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this one, but that goes to show how it works. Um, yeah, a histogram where you can play around with the bin width uh, something, and even the box plot you know by now. So you can see that the median value is here and so on, and you see that in that direction there are even some real outlier points, the ones that are um, plotted on their own. Okay, next is one of my favorites. I'll just throw it onto the... I've got the card data again. I'm a card person somehow. Um, but I only got, I limited it to five cars and eight measures. And with that, you can do a radar plot like this. I, I find them just optically appealing. That's why I show it here. Um, you can always approach this from two directions. Either you, you choose one car, let's go for whatever, uh, the Ford Pantera in yellow. So you can follow the yellow line here. You see that uh, the Ford Pantera is top on cylinders, probably has eight cylinders, I know. It's top on engine displacement, comes in second with horsepower and so on. Or what you can do is you can approach it from the outside. You go down here and you say, oh, horsepower. What is going on with the horsepower? And you see the green one is on top, Maserati. Second one is the fourth, third on horsepower is the Ferrari, and so on. Okay, if, if you have, of course, a lot of cars, a lot of measures, uh, it doesn't make so much sense. But for a small number of uh, uh, examples, samples, and a rather small number of measures, <coughs> you can use it like that. Then, oh yeah, maps, of course. Everyone likes maps in their visualizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had to redo this one because I had another city um, where they, they've hidden the data in the meantime, so that, that's a new one. 
Um, this is the data from Konstanz, a town in the southern part of Germany on the Lake Bodensee. Uh, that's data on the public parking lots, parking garages um, that, are, uh, that are operated by the city. Um, you have the name, you have the capacity, and you have in real time how many spots are actually free in that one. And also you have, um, yeah, that's a timestamp, uh, you have the coordinates. So, what you can do, let me just pull the time here. What you can do is just get a map in this case from Google Maps and then just plot the points onto the map. Like this, and that goes in this window. Yep. I hope you can see that the bright um, green points here, uh, at the moment they all have the status open. If there were some clothes, it would be like in red, and then if they are distorted, it's black or blue or something. And you can tell from the size of the circles how many places are free. So you see that probably this one down here, the green circle, there's the most capacity uh, of parking lots free. And you see up here, yeah, that is probably, no, oh, it's real time, here. So it's actually the current data, I just pulled it over the internet. And because they have integrated the coordinates, you just plot the points on the map. Otherwise, you would take around doing um, uh, the geocoding. It's also possible with, uh, with the Google API. And then you can plot them. All right. So next one is a first. Actually, because I had to rebuild the, the animated stuff. Let me see how it works. Mm. Yeah, come on. That's not animated yet. Um, that is data from the International Monetary Fund, and we have stuff like um, employment rated and gross, uh, uh, how you call it, um, country product, and so on for the EU states. That one is just for overview. You have on top, you have the states of the EU, I think they are, and there you've got the, the government revenue, uh, domestic products, average consumer, whatever it is, I don't remember, unemployment rate. And you see, of course, um, the development during the time. There are some that are doing better, some are, are more volatile. Um, but what I actually wanted to show you is how you can animate this. Who knows um, Hans Rosling and the Gapminer product uh, project? None of you, okay. So Hans Rosling, sadly, he is not with us anymore. He was a Swedish, um, a Swedish researcher, and, and he did talks on how should I put it? Uh, what's actually behind the numbers, if you see like poverty and, and unemployment rate and, and development of the countries, and he, he uh, invented this kind of, um, of graphics you're gonna see right now. It takes a past seconds. Okay. I always thought the Mac was really a graph machine, but for the animated stuff, it takes its time. So that gives me time to just, any of you who do not want to appear on the internet, maybe check your shoelaces for a moment or so. And the rest of you smile. Thank you. Hope I've got everyone. Uh, no, go on, 17 seconds. Was it? Check. So and that's one for the for the viewer pane here, and because it's that new, I, I did not get to find out how to zoom it properly. You can see up there the years running through permanently from whatever when we start. Right. 
1980 or so. Um, and we see, oh, what do we even see? We see the unemployment rate. For all the countries that are, are color coded here, and you see while the, the year goes on and on, you see where each country is um, relative to the um, general government revenue. So just comparing two figures here, but uh, I thought the graphical impression was very nice. Uh, I can even take it one step further if we have the time. Oh, maybe I should stop that one. Okay. Yeah, I should have stopped the other one. Oh, yeah, good. We, we got that minute, haven't we? Standard box plot, as far as I know, okay. uh, the, the percentiles. Okay. It's, it's a 25, 50, and 75 percentile. So yes, they have to make it go back. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure what the, what the whisker length, uh, what, what that is about. I, I think that's one and a half lengths of the, of, of the box part, but I'm not sure if that relates to standard deviation some, somehow. So, come on. So let me just zoom in there. So here we got even the, the, the country flags. I mean, okay, it's it's an optical gimmick uh, <laughs> flying around. If you're interested in that kind of stuff and more, if it really what you can represent with it, look for Hans Rosling and the Gapminder project. His son is, is carrying it on. Hans is, uh, has died a couple of years ago. He did lots of TED talk talks and, and did those representations. Um, you can download my scripts, and it always where it uses library something. You can download that library into your R system if you want to replace any uh, replay any of, of, of the stuff. So all, all of those are available freely. So just for the maps that I showed you, I had to use the Google API key which was mine, so I can't give that to you. So you have to look um, if you can get your own. It was supposed to work with, with OSM also, but uh, they, they stopped cooperating at some point in time. I'm not going to go into details there. So maybe can I make you smile with those? The so-called Chernov faces, so the guy, probably a Russian, called Chernov invented these. Um, so you can see that we have uh, displacement and mileage again. Uh, we have color-coded cylinders, and we have smiling faces where the mileage is high, and it goes down to murr. You're driving a gasoline gas or still where the mileage is really low. Yeah, something to cheer folks up. Maybe it's not if you present to your C-suite executives. <laughs> Don't do that. Right. So, uh, okay, one serious thing you can do. So if you um, have to analyze that data, you get the plot like this. And maybe you're interested, especially in the six-cylinder models, 
what you can do here is a so-called um, facet zoom, where you get the data of the 60 nanoparticles plus a bit uh, margin there, spread out over the whole width of your, of your screen uh, to take a closer look. This is also possible uh, in the direction of the y-axis. Uh, and I think if your screen is big enough, you can also do it both sides at one time. Okay, I mentioned uh, you can play on with colors and themes and things like that. A quick run through through some of them. I have a plot again. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> not very creative, but uh, yeah, the displacement. I, I, I store that plot into a variable, which is something you can do easily in, in R. You can store anything in a variable. So what I do here, I just call the variable and add a theme on it every time. Different theme. So, let me see. This is, what is it? No, that's the plot on its own. And then you can do themes like this. LibreOffice would make it look like this. Uh, the economists, they have their standards that would look like this. Stephen Few, Google Docs. So it's always the same graph, actually, and just added one theme on top of it. It's all our theme. Stata, if anyone uses the Stata language, I know nobody. Uh, Wall Street Journal. And if you install um, yes, some extra fonts there, you can make it look a bit like Googleish, also. Okay, which brings me to my final visualization. This one and that finally goes into the other. So again, the data is not very great if here, but what you can actually do is have interactivity in your in your graphs. And for this, I just display the um, the car make and model. You can also implement um, properties so when you click on a point, it, it opens a website or something like that. So interactivity is also possible. Okay, so that was the end of my demo. And we're back here. So as I said, I, I, I have one sentence, uh, what they are all about, and enlisted them up here. And I think we checked them all. So we come to this point. So I hope I could give you an expression that even with an open source product such as R, a lot is possible when it comes to visualization and also analysis. And it goes also in the direction of data science. But I wanted to concentrate on the, on the visualizations part. Uh, if you apply the tidyverse philosophy, as, as we saw in the beginning, have the proper data format, and then from there on you can you can move your data without any further problem uh, into the ggplot uh, calls, for instance. And that's always it is a very small effort of coding. Once you have your data in shape, the the call to ggplot basically it was a one or two liner every time. I don't know if you noticed, and and the rest was just pretty fine, like having labels, uh, using different colors, and stuff like that. Yeah? So, but yeah, even in this course, sometimes less is more. As I said, general faces are not for every audience. Don't overdo, overload. Like right in the beginning, where I had all the, um, all the race results of all, even if it was only nine drivers, all of them in one graphic, that was totally crowded. You, you can't get any information out of that. The next step was to do the facet where every driver had his own. Okay, so yeah, consider how much is just not too much. Right. If you follow the, the first two links, there's the, the base R um, system, and you get the packages also from there. And as I said, I'm using R Studio now, I would recommend it. It's just a de facto standard. As the IDE that you saw all the time, uh, you could start then probably with the with the tutorials on the on the top right. You click through there. Um, uh, if you load a, a R script like my demo file, 
for the first time, it probably the, the R Studio will tell you at the top which packages are missing. Do you want to install them? Or you just click, yeah, give it. Okay. <clears throat> then we've got yeah, some links that inspired me, like the top 50 list and, uh, and the list of extension and so on. And I recommend, if you want to dig in deeper, those two books. I still like to read books on paper. Uh, the graphics cookbook is on paper only, I think. The data science book is available online at that address. Um, they are in the works of doing a second edition, I think. Right. So that barcode is a first also. Can you, come on, can you scan it and tell me if that works, someone? That's the barcode to the link where you can find my demo script and my slides. Thanks. Usually I only have the link to the barcode, why not? Okay, and um, yeah, that's my uh, social media accounts again. And um, I think we're through. Uh, one minute over time. Thank you for your time and your interest and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>